Hello, and welcome back to Neural Data Science. Today we're going to learn about Pandas data frames. The questions we're going to address are, how do I read in data from a file? How can I work with data in tabular format, in other words, tables? And how can I do basic descriptive statistics on tabular data? So our learning objectives are to select individual values from a Pandas data frame. We can we'll also learn how to select entire rows or entire columns from a data frame. We'll select a subset of both rows and columns from a data frame in a single operation, select a subset of data frame by a single Boolean criterion, obtain descriptive statistics for subsets of data within a table, and use the split apply combine paradigm to work with data. So as you might guess just from the learning objectives, this is quite a, a meaty lesson. There's lots to cover here, but what's really exciting about Pandas is it is a really powerful way of working with data and really represents a big step from working with data in the relatively simple uh, pandas or Python data types that we've seen so far, like lists and dictionaries, to something that can uh, hold and organize uh, really dense and rich data and do really powerful operations on that data with relatively few and simple Python commands. Pandas has nothing to do with fuzzy bears. Pandas, whose official name starts with a lowercase p, is a Python library or package for working with data in tabular format. So a pandas data frame is very similar to, say, a Microsoft Excel uh, spreadsheet or a Google Sheets uh, spreadsheet. However, there's no point-and-click graphical interface for working with these files. Everything's done through Python code. Primary units of pandas data storage that we'll work with are data frames. Data frames themselves are actually collections of pandas series objects. So uh, a pandas series you can think of as a single row or a single column. Uh, also called a vector or a 1D array. Among the things that make pandas so attractive are the powerful interface to access individual records of the table, proper handling of missing values, and relational database operations between data frames. As well, pandas functions and methods are written to work intuitively and efficiently with data organized in tables. Most of these operations are vectorized, which means they'll automatically apply to all values in a data frame or series without the need to write a for loop or execute the same operation on a set of cells. So this makes working with data frames both fast and efficient. Pandas is built on top of another Python library called NumPy. Although we haven't discussed NumPy yet, it's a powerful and widely used Python library for working with numerical data. Uh, we'll, we'll encounter NumPy later in this course as well, but it's worth noting for future reference that most of the methods defined for NumPy arrays also apply to pandas series and data frames. So when we get to NumPy, a lot of working with NumPy data will be very familiar because of what you've learned about uh, pandas. All right. Um, as a, a sort of a sidebar, pandas is an example of a Python library, or again, uh, we might say a package. A library is a collection of files called modules that contain functions for use by other programs. Libraries provide ways of extending Python's functionality in different ways. So they might contain data values like numerical constants, like say the value of pi. Uh, they might contain entire sample data sets and other things beyond just additional functions uh, and operations that you can do. A library's contents tend to be related, although there's no actual way to enforce that. But for example, the pandas library contains a set of routines for working with pandas data frames and, and tabular format. So back a few lessons, we had a lesson on Python built-ins. That's the Python standard library. And it's a pretty extensive suite of modules that comes right built into to Python. Um, everything we've done so far in, in these lessons has been part of the standard library. Um, but there's many, many other libraries that are available. A lot of these are already installed on CoCalc, like pandas. So there's nothing you need to do uh, to install them. To use a particular library in a Jupyter Notebook or other Python program, you have to explicitly import it. So this is the thing about these libraries. They're all sort of separate. They're installed. But if you actually want to use the, the functions in the library, you need to first import it in your code. And we do that just using uh, the simple um, import command. So import pandas in this case. Once the library is imported, we can use functions and methods from it. Um, but for functions, we have to tell Python that the function can be found in a particular library. So for example, in this example uh, here, you see read CSV is a function in the pandas library for reading comma separated values files. But we can't just run read CSV, we have to run pandas dot read CSV. So Python knows which package or, or library uh, to look at to find that particular function. And a convention in Python is that when you import a package, you can give it an alias, so a shorter name. 
So here you can see that we can run import pandas, like we've shown above, but we say as pd, and now we're giving it the alias pd, and then every time we want to run a command that's in pandas, we just have to type pd.readcsv. So it makes your code a little shorter, saves you a bit of typing, and pd is the standard abbreviation or alias that you'll see for pandas. So, okay, that's a bit of an introduction. Now we're going to actually import pandas uh, with the alias pd into this notebook. So I'm going to write import pandas as pd. Run that. And as with a lot of Python commands, you don't see any explicit output, but you don't get an error message, which means that it ran successfully. All right, so now we're moving on to actually importing data with pandas. So we can read a CSV file, comma separated value file, um, with the function pd.readcsv. CSV is a text format for storing tabular data. Uh, it's quite common. You can save CSV files in Excel and other spreadsheet programs. Uh, and basically, it's a simple text file, and each row is a line of the text file, and the columns are separated by commas, hence comma-separated values, or CSV. The Gapminder data that we're going to be working with is in CSV format. So let's load in one of the Gapminder data sets with the command below. So you can see the command here. It's df. So df is an abbreviation for data frame, and that's, again, kind of a standard shorthand that people working with pandas use is to, if you can name your table whatever you want, but a good default name is df, especially if you're working with a single data frame. So df equals pd dot read underscore csv parenthesis, and then we tell it where to find the data file. In this case, the data file is in a subdirectory called data, and the data file itself is called gapminder underscore gdp underscore europe dot csv. So I'll write data slash gapminder underscore gdp underscore europe dot csv. And this whole thing has to be in quote marks because it's a string. So I'll run this cell. And again, we don't see any explicit output, but we don't see an error message. So we assume everything ran just fine. So now we can actually view the contents of that data frame, df, by simply typing its name and running the cell, like this. Now, OK, so there we go. There's the output. And you can see that we have a first column that's labeled country. And you can see the column labels appear in bold across the top. And that has rows for different country names. And then the subsequent columns are all GDP per cap, so gross domestic product per capita in different years, 1952, 1957, et cetera. And my window's a bit too big to scroll uh, for you to see everything, um, but that goes uh, through the, the 20th century. Um, now, one thing that I'll, I'll point out is I just ran the command df. Uh, in previous lessons, a lot of the time we use the print command. So we might say print df uh, to generate output. Uh, the reason that we don't do that is pandas, when you use the print command, gives you a much less pretty formatted output. It gives you something that looks a little more raw, a little harder to read. Um, and in general, if you're viewing a data frame with something like the df command, that's the only command you're running in the cell anyway. So it doesn't really matter that um, you're not using the print command. You're, you're pretty much guaranteed that you will see the output uh, come out on the screen. All right, so this is the organization of a pandas data frame. The other thing I'll point out is that the first, uh, it's not actually a column here, but what looks like a column is numbers. And those numbers, again, Python counts starting from zero. Those are numbering uh, the rows of the data frame. This first column is actually called the index, and it's not really a column. It's basically the rows, uh, the labels for the rows. So just like the columns have labels, the rows have labels, and those are the indexes. So that first column isn't data. It's uh, sort of metadata or labels uh, for the rows, which by default are just numbers. And you can tell here that we have lots of data. It would be incredibly tedious to try and type this in and store it as a Python list or a dictionary or, or something like that. So this is one of the, the real values of pandas is the ability to store and organize large amounts of data and work with it. Another thing we can do is we can peek at a data frame without printing out the whole thing, especially where it's big. So you saw with that example, the data frame was actually um, much larger than we could visualize. So if we run df.head, dot head is a method 
in pandas, whoops, dot head, that allows us to see the first five rows of a data frame. And the corresponding laser is a df.tail method that will show us the last five rows in the data frame. Now, in both those cases, I ran the command without any argument inside the parentheses, but head and tail both take a numeric argument, a single argument, that is the number of rows. So five is the default, but if I say df.tail10, I'll get the last 10 rows. And as the, the text is telling me here, the other thing I can do is say df.sample, and rather than getting the first x number of rows or the last num x number of rows, the way we do with head and tail, sample will just randomly sample the specified number of rows from your data frame. And it's, because it's random, you can see here, they're not organized alphabetically anymore. So they're just, each time uh, it goes through, it picks out a random row and adds that to, to the output. Pandas also provides us with really powerful ways of accessing values in a data frame. And one of these is .iloc, so another method. And this is a lot like uh, using indexing for lists and slicing for lists, as we learned about before. So I stands for index location. Uh, so for this example, we're saying df.iloc square bracket one comma two. And so the syntax here is the row number and then the column number. And again, pandas being Python counts from zero, as you can see in this table here. So the top left corner of your data frame is index 00. zero. The first column in the first row is zero 01, etc. So when I ask for df iloc 1, 2, I'm asking for the value that's stored in row 1, which is the second row, and column 2, which is the third column. So if I execute that, I'll get this value 8842.59. Now if I'm going to scroll up and look at row one, column two, 8842.598030 is in fact the value that's stored there. The other way that we can access data in a pandas data frame is using label-based indexing with the dot lock method. So dot iloc is for using numerical indexing, dot lock is for using label indexing. And so remember up above, and again, I'll scroll back up, uh, so, for example, here I talked about this first not officially a row or not officially a column part of the data frame. Those are the indexes. So right now our indexes are just what pandas applied by default when we imported the data, which is numbers starting at zero. But we can tell pandas that we want another column to be uh, the indexes. And in this case, what makes sense is to make the country the indexes. So the countries become the labels for the rows because all of the other data is numerical uh, GDP per capita data, but that first column is, is the labels for each row. So in order to do label-based indexing, we need to also have labels as our indexes. So we can do that with this data frame by saying df equals df.set underscore index and country. So country is the name of the column that I want to make the index. I'm using this method set index on data frame on DF, and I'm then assigning the result of that back to DF. And that's actually important because if I just ran df.set index country, it would execute the command, but it wouldn't actually save it back in DF. So you need to remember to assign that output back to DF. So I run that. And uh, just as a side note, if you already know when you're importing the data, which column is the index, um, here's the pd.readcsv command that we ran up above to originally import the data. So I could have actually added this second argument to the readcsv command, index underscore call. So index column equals and tell it which country or which column I want to be the index. It would do that in one step when I imported the data rather than having to run a separate set index command later. All right, so now that I have the countries set as the indexes for the rows and the columns are already labeled, now I can actually use the df.lock command. So df.lock square bracket, and now I'm going to give it the row that I want, so Austria, and the column that I want, so GDP per cap underscore 1952. And now I get a value, and that's the value for Austria in that year. 
So that's how we access data, a single cell in a data frame using the, the row, comma, column uh, sort of syntax, either using dot iLock if I want to use numerical indexing or dot lock if I want to use label-based indexing. So the next thing we can see is that as we learned for working with lists and list indexing, we can use the colon to mean all of the columns or all of the rows when we're using this kind of uh, dot lock uh, selection. So in this first example, I'm going to do df.lock square bracket, and I'll give it Albania as the row index that I want to pull out, comma, and then a colon. And what that's going to do is show me the values for all of the columns uh, corresponding to Albania. And you can see that Pandas doesn't put this out in a nice tabular format. It prints it out in this sort of lower level, more simple looking uh, text format. The reason for that is that the output of this command is actually not a data frame, it's a pandas series. You may remember earlier in the lesson, I talked about the fact that a pandas data frame can be thought of as a collection of series, where a series is just a single row or a single column. So when your output from a pandas command is just one uh, sort of one dimensional set of values, um, so here we just have one column of values or one row of values. Uh, then pandas will show it to you as a series in the sort of simpler format rather than a nice tabular format. Um, okay, another thing that we could do, and I'll add a cell above so that I can actually type this, is df.lock and square brackets. So I can use a colon in the first position. So I want to say all rows corresponding to the column of GDP per cap underscore 1957. And again, my output is a pandas series, not a data frame. And we have all the different GDPs for all the countries. So we got all the rows and one particular column. You actually don't have to use a colon if you're specifying the row index and you want all columns. Um, so if I say df.lock square bracket Albania, that gives me the same output as I got above when I said Albania comma colon. So you, if, if you don't give dot .lock or dot .ilock a second value, then it's just going to assume you want all of the columns. Um, that doesn't work in reverse because the syntax for dot .lock and dot .ilock is row, comma, column. So if you don't, if, whatever you give first is assumed to be rows, not columns. Uh, as you might suspect based on previous lessons, Slicing works on data frames in a way similar to the way it works with lists. So while we can use the colon to mean all rows or all columns, we can specify a range using the colon to get a slice of just a certain set of a certain range of rows and columns. So here I'm going to do df.ilock square bracket 2 colon 5 and 4 colon 8. So I'm asking for rows two to five. And again, the slicing, as we learned before, means start with row two and go up to, but not including row five, and then start with column four and go up to, but not including column eight. So you can see here, I get rows number two, three, and four, but not five, and columns four, five, six, seven, but not eight. So again, the slicing goes up to, but not including the last number that you give it. And some of the other tricks that we learned already about slicing apply with dot .ilock as well. So df.ilock square bracket five colon negative one will go from the fifth row to the last column. And eight colon as my, or sorry, fifth row to the last row. And 8 colon will go from column 8 to the end. And you can see that. And again, when I say minus 1 last row, it goes up to but not including the last row, which in this uh, data frame was United Kingdom. So you can see we don't get that. We just get Turkey. But because the, the columns went to 8 colon, it goes all the way to the end. 2007 is the last year that we have data for in this data frame. One thing to see is that although this sort of up to but not including the last number applies for the dot .ilock indexing, and I'll run that here. Um, so df dot .ilock square bracket zero colon two 
and comma six colon seven. So that gives me Albania and Austria for 1982. So it gives me rows zero and one, but not two, and column six, but not seven. But the dot lock label-based indexing doesn't work like that. So when I say dot lock Albania to Belgium, I'm going to get Albania and all the countries up to and including Belgium. Similarly, when I say GDP per cap 1982 colon GDP per cap 1988, I get all the columns from 1982 up to and including 1988. So on the one hand, this may seem kind of strange, Albania... Uh, and inconsistent. On the other hand, um, it kind of makes sense because the numerical slicing with .ilock is consistent with slicing of lists and other kinds of slicing in, in Python. But when we're using label-based indexing, um, it sort of makes sense to say that if I say Albania to Belgium, I, I actually want Belgium. I'm not going through and sort of looking at what's the next country label after Belgium, because so, those labels can be entirely arbitrary. So it makes sense that you would include uh, the whole range that you're specifying. Okay, so Albania to Belgium, and then GDP per cap underscore 1982, colon, oops, I need to close the quotes, colon, GDP per cap underscore 1988. Right. So now you see I get three rows and two columns rather than two rows and one column. So it's just important to remember that they work slightly differently. But if you've already got the hand of uh, indexing and slicing from working with lists, the dot .ilock syntax is consistent with that. And with the label-based indexing with dot .lock, again, it works very intuitively that you give it the labels that you want the range of, and it goes from the one you specify at the start to the one you specify at the end. Another cool thing we can do with dot .lock is select non-contiguous sections of a data frame. So what I mean by that is non-adjacent, non right? So in this example, I said Albania to Belgium, and I got Albania, Austria, and Belgium, which are all the rows between Albania and Belgium. But what if I wanted specific countries, like, say, Scandinavian countries that aren't alphabetically next to each other in the table? Um, so I can do this with uh, this sort of uh, nested indexing. So df.lock, square bracket, so far the same. But now to specify the row labels that I want, I'm going to open another set of square brackets. Uh, this time this is for a list. And I'm going to provide a list of the specific rows that I want. So Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden. OK. And I'm going to go outside of that list. So that first list is the rows that I want, and then the columns that I want, so comma, and then another list, and again, the specific column labels that I want. So GDP per cap underscore 1992, and GDP per cap underscore 2002. Run that. And so I get Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, 1992, and 2002. So lists uh, can be substituted in for the arguments for both the rows and the columns, and you can be very specific as to exactly which row labels and which column labels you want. Um, this next, next example is just taking the same code, so I'll, I'll just copy and paste that because it's the identical code. Um, but just as sort of a, a nice way of formatting your code, if I hit enter after the comma here, then my row the, the list of rows that I want to select is on one line. The list of columns that I want to select is on the next line. And I'll hit enter again and put that closing square bracket for the dot lock command on another line. And it, it's now sort of makes your code a bit longer, but it is a little clearer in terms of which are the rows, which are the, the columns, and uh, distinguishing the square brackets for dot lock with the square brackets defining the lists for the rows and, and for the columns. Um, another thing that we can do is we can predefine those lists rather than specifying them right in the dot lock command. Uh, so we can define them, save them as variables, and then just use those variable names in our command. So in this case, scanned underscore countries equals, and I'm going to say, whoops, square bracket, because I'm defining a list, Denmark, 
Finland, Iceland, and sorry, Iceland, I left you out of the Scandinavian countries in the previous example, but you're here now, Norway, and Sweden. Okay, and then I can define the years I want as a second list saved to a variable called years. And for that, I want GDP per cap underscore 1992 and GDP per cap underscore 2002. And then to run my df.lock command, I say df.lock square bracket, then give it the name of list of rows. So scanned underscore countries and the list of columns, which is years. And then I get that output. So this can be very powerful in that you can define lists ahead of time and then plug them into a dot lock command uh, to access their values. All right, another thing we can do is we can actually assign that output so of df.lock rather than just showing it on the screen, we can actually assign it to a new variable name to create a new table. So in this case, I'm gonna say scanned underscore data equals df.lock square bracket scanned underscore countries comma years and missing from my example is then i'm just going to say scanned underscore data run that and show the the output is now the same but that's the output of asking for that actual data frame stored as a variable called scanned data another thing about pandas data frames is it's actually easy to do simple math and statistics with the values in the data frames so look at this, uh, I can say df.lock square bracket Italy. So I'm gonna select, in this case, I'm just giving it one argument. So I'm gonna select all of the columns for the, the row of Italy. So basically all of the GDP per capita over the entire data set. Um, and then dot mean. So mean dot mean is a method for pandas data frames and it will return the mean of all of the rows. So we can get simple summary statistics like that. Um, other functions that we've learned about work as well. So df.lock square bracket, I'm gonna select all of the countries, so all of the rows, and then GDP per cap underscore 1977 dot max, and that will show me the maximum GDP per cap in 1977. Now, I don't know which country is actually associated with that value. Um, sometimes you might care about that and we'll see how to, how to get at that later but uh, this mat dot max will just return the maximum value, and at least you can find that. Another really useful method is dot describe, which will print out a range of descriptive statistics for the uh, data that you specify. So if I run df dot describe, it assumes that I want the descriptive statistics for each column in the data frame. And you can see here, I get that now. So for 1952, I have the count, so the number of rows, basically the number of values, which is 30. The mean of those values is 5661, uh, standard deviation, minimum value, maximum value, and then also the 25th, 50th, and 75th quartiles. Um, mean, so 50th quartile would be equivalent to the median uh, of the data. Okay, so now we have a mini exercise, and because it's an exercise, I encourage you to pause the video and try and solve this one on your own, and then unpause and I'll work through the solution. Okay, so we're being asked to use the scanned countries and years variables to view descriptive statistics for all Scandinavian countries in each year. So um, remember that we defined that before, so we can say df.lock square bracket scanned underscore countries and years, and we want it for each year. So remember that if I say dot describe, without specifying any columns, it'll assume that I want output for each column. So let's see how that works. Scan.countries.describe. Okay. And now we have the descriptive statistics across all the Scandinavian countries in each year. So each column. So dot describe, and we only had to give it the, the row indexes because by default dot describe will give you the output for each column separately. Another thing we can do is evaluate cells based on conditions. Um, so remember in the last lesson on conditionals, we learned about if statements and we could use an if statement like if each value in a list is greater than 10,000, 
uh, do one thing if it's not greater than 10,000, do another thing. In pandas, we can do a lot of that without even using an if statement. So in this example, we're going to define countries as a set of countries in Western Europe. So I'm going to define a list that includes France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the United Kingdom. And I see my typo there. And now I'm going to say df.lock, square bracket, countries. So I'm going to select the rows corresponding to those countries I just defined. And then as the columns, I want two different columns. I want GDP per cap underscore 1962 and GDP per cap 1992. And then I say greater than 10,000. So what this is going to do is first select those countries, the rows corresponding to those countries in these two rows, but then it's only going to return the values that are actually greater than 10,000. And what did I fail to do? I failed to put my column labels in quotes and make them strings. So here we go. And what we get is actually not the data stored in those individual cells, but we get a true false statement. So it's basically telling me where it says true, this statement is true. GDP per cap is greater than 10,000 for that country in that year. Or for a couple of cases, Italy and Spain in 1962, that's false. So the GDP per capita was less than 10,000 in those years. So this provides us uh, with a way of what's called masking the data set and selecting values that meet certain criteria, such as uh, a greater than criteria. And the next thing we're going to learn about is how to select values using NAN, which stands for not a number, and a Boolean mask. So a data frame full of Booleans, these true-false values are, are called Booleans. It's a, a specific Python data type that's just true or false, which also can be thought of incidentally as true is equal to 1 and false is equal to 0. So a data frame full of Booleans is sometimes called a mask because of how it can be used. A mask removes values that are not true and replaces them with NAN, which is a special Python value representing not a number. This can be useful because pandas ignores NAND values when doing computations. So for example, if I ask for run a dot mean method, it'll compute the mean while ignoring any NAND values. So we can create a mask by assigning the output of a conditional statement to a variable name. So up above, we had a conditional statement, uh, df.lock countries, comma, and these two years greater than 10,000. And the data frame was output just to the screen here, to my notebook. But instead of doing that, I can assign the output to a variable name, in this case, mask. So mask equals scanned underscore data greater than 30,000. Okay, and then we can apply this mask to the data frame to get only the values that meet this criteria. So this was already saying the mask is going to be the Scandinavian data where the GDP is over 30,000. So now if I say scanned underscore data um, with mask. And you notice here that I'm not saying dot lock or dot I lock. I'm just saying scanned data, whoops, spell, spelling error there, mask. So this is kind of like list indexing or something like that. So now it's going to return numerical values where the GDP was actually above 30,000, which was my criterion. And the other uh, cells, it's just re returning NAN. So it sort of masks them out, hides them, so that we just get the values that we're particularly interested in. As an example of how you might use this, we could actually then pass the output of that selection, scanned underscore data, square bracket mask, to the dot min method. And again, spelling error. And it'll tell me what's the minimum GDP in that data set that's above 30,000. And it does it for each column. So in the first column, there was only one value anyway. In the second column, it tells me that the minimum value within that selected data set is 31,163. Okay, so all of this leads us to a really common and powerful process or, or task that uh, is used in data science. And this is called split apply combine. 
very often what we want to do in data science is split data into meaningful subgroups and apply an operation to each subgroup. So example, compute the mean of each subgroup and then combine those results into a single output, such as a new table or a new data frame. Uh, this paradigm was famously first described by Hadley Wickham in a 2011 paper that I've got linked there. Um, of course, people were doing it before then, but Hadley uh, really sort of defined this process and he, he originally wrote R code uh, and an R package to work with this. But the same thing is, is what we're doing here with Pandas. Uh, and Pandas provides methods and grouping operations that are very efficient, um, and the, the technical term for that is vectorized, for doing these split apply combine operations. So for example, in terms of splitting the data into meaningful subgroups, say that we wanted to compare the average GDP for different regions of Europe, such as Northern Europe, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Uh, so the first step is we have to define lists defining the countries that belong to each of these regions. You can see that here. Um, it's a lot of typing, so perfectly legit in this case to copy and paste um, all of those and just run that cell. So now we have Northern, Southern, Eastern, and Western as variable names for lists that will specify a, a set of countries. Next, we can make a new column. Uh, simply by using dot lock with the rows specified by one of the lists we just defined, a column name that doesn't exist, in this case we'll call it region, and then assigning a region label to that combination of rows and column. So in other words, in our original DF data frame, we want to create a new column called region, and each row is a country, right? So each row is now going to have a value in that region column that tells us which region of Europe it's from. So I can say df.lock, square bracket, northern, northern, comma, and then region. So what I'm doing here, df.lock, with a list of the northern European countries, and then I'm specifying a column called region. And Pandas is smart enough to know that if I specify a column name that doesn't exist, and I'm performing assignment, so I use equals, and then this value northern as a string, it knows that what I'm telling it to do is create a new column called region and fill in northern there. I'm actually going to run this before I type in and run the other uh, cells just to show you what that looks like as a result. So now I'm going to say df dot, uh, let's say df dot head first of all. We got the first few countries there. I'm going to scroll over and you can see that it's created now a region column that wasn't there before. And none of these first five rows countries were actually in what I defined as Northern Europe. And so the region value for all of them is NAN, not a number. So when I ran this command here and assigned a value of Northern to the region column only for the rows that corresponded to Northern European countries, it created that column and it just filled in NANs for all the rows where they didn't meet that criterion of being a Northern country. So then I can go through and just run all the other commands that I have in the instructions there. So df.lock southern, comma, region. So now we're selecting the rows corresponding to southern European countries, the column region, which now exists, and we're going to plug in for those rows the value southern. And df.lock eastern, and region equals the string eastern. And finally, df.lock square bracket western comma region equals western. Run that. And now when I run df head, I can see if I scroll over that region is filled in for these first five rows. And I could also run, just to select or, or sort of sample a wider range of rows, I could say df.sample, and maybe I want just some eight random rows from the data frame. So you can see I get those, there are a variety of countries there, and check the region column, and indeed it's Eastern or Northern, so each row has a label. Okay, so now we've created a grouping variable. And we can use this to split the data according to regions. So now I'm going to create a new variable 
grouped underscore countries. And it's going to be equal to df.group by region. Oh, typo. So dot group by is another pandas method that, as the name implies, groups the, the data in the pandas data frame by a particular variable. In this case, uh, we're grouping by the column region. So I run that. It doesn't actually create a new data frame. So group countries isn't a data frame. It creates a special kind of pandas object. So if I say, what is the type of grouped countries? You can see that it's a pandas.core.groupby.generic.dataframe group by. Um, so it's not actually a new data frame. It's just uh, essentially sort of a, a more abstract representation of the data that is grouping the data by region. But we can then use that in other pandas operations um, to, to do our apply step. So here we're going to assign output to something called mean underscore GDP underscore by underscore region equals. Uh, and then we give it our group by object, grouped countries, uh, and apply the dot mean method. So in other words, the split operation was to group by region, and the apply is to apply a particular computation, in this case, compute the mean. And we're going to save that in mean GDP by region. And that step is actually kind of also the, the right-hand side of that is the apply. So we're applying dot mean. And the left-hand side of that, assigning that output to mean GDP by region is our combine, because the result, if we actually ask for, you know, what is mean GDP by region? Well, it's a new pandas data frame with region being the index and all the same columns that we had originally, uh, except region, because now region's the index. And the values there are now the mean across all of the countries in that region for that particular year. So we've gone from a data frame where we had all the individual countries using split apply, apply combined to get means across each of those groups of countries for each year. So that was sort of a, a very stepwise explicit way of doing the split apply combine with a pandas data frame. But we can actually do it in less lines of code more efficiently through something called chaining. And in fact, we can do it once we've defined the region uh, column and labeled each row by its region. Uh, we can actually use a single line of code using chaining, which means we're just sort of uh, uh, sticking the different uh, pandas methods to each other in a single line of code. So df is our data frame dot group by region. So df dot group by region is what we ran before, but we had assigned it to grouped countries. Then we applied dot mean to grouped countries, assigned that to mean GDP by region, and then looked at that. All we're doing here is saying df dot group by region dot mean. So rather than assigning the output of group by to a variable and then using that in a separate line of code to run dot mean, we just combine those in a single line of code. Um, I'm going to run this. In this case, it just outputs to our notebook, but we could also um, say uh, that we want that assigned to mean GDP by region like that. So assign that output to a variable name and then just ask for that variable name. And whether you have it spit out to the screen and to the notebook or save it as a variable kind of depends on what you want to do with it later. If all you want to do is visualize it, then it's fine just to spit it out to this to the, the notebook. But maybe you want to work with that data frame, the resulting data frame later, in which case you would save it uh, to a variable. All right, so this brings us to the end of the lesson on pandas, and now we're getting into exercises. So here they are, and as always, I encourage you to pause the video, work through these exercises on your own, then unpause the video and I'll work through them with you. All right, so our first exercise is selecting individual values, and we're being asked to write an expression to find the per capita GDP of Serbia in 2007. So because we're given the names Serbia in 2007, those are labels, so we want to use df.lock, not .iloc, because .iloc would be for numerical indexing. We want labels. Square bracket. And then the row is the country name, so Serbia. 
And then all of the columns start with GDP, capital P for per cap, underscore 2007. Shift enter to run that, and we get the value. There we go. All right, and the next one is to think about and kind of reinforce what I talked about before around the extent of slicing and particularly how the second value, the one after the colon, gets applied when slicing using dot .ilock and dot .lock. And so the first question is, do the two statements below produce the same output? And the answer is no. And then the second question is, based on this, what rule governs what is included or not? in using numerical slices or named slices in pandas. So as I talked about before, when we use .ilock, it applies the normal sort of Python approach to slicing with numerical indexes, which it goes from the first index value that you give it. So in this case, we go from zero up to, but not including uh, the row number two. So we get rows zero and one, but not two. And likewise, we get columns 0 and 1, but not column 2. Um, whereas if we ask for Albania to Belgium, and here, as I suggest, we might want to look at the head of the data frame to remind ourselves how it's organized. Right? So Albania, Austria, Belgium. So Belgium is, if we count these in Python, 0, 1, 2. So Belgium is the row number 2, and GDP per cap 1962 is 0, 1, 2. It's the column labeled indexed as 2. So 0 to 2, 0 to 2 with dot .ilock, we'll get Albania and Austria for 1952 and 1957. But when we use the label-based indexing, we get all of the countries up to and including the label that we give it uh, after the colon. So the output of the second command would be Albania, Austria, and Belgium, 1952, 1957, and 1962. And you can certainly run those two commands if you want uh, to compare the outputs. Our next exercise is on reconstructing data. And what you've been asked to do is explain what each line in the following short program does. So what is in DF1, DF2, etc. Now this is understandably a more challenging exercise because it's actually introducing and trying to teach you through kind of an inferential process, some additional pandas tricks uh, that you haven't learned already in the lesson. Uh, so let's walk through that and see what's happening. So the first line is df1 equals pd.read underscore csv. So we're gonna read a pandas, uh, read a CSV file into pandas as a data frame. The data file name is in the folder data and the file name is gapminder underscore all dot csv. So we're going to read that file and we already know that the index column that we want is called country. So index underscore call equals country. All right. So rather than typing in all the code and running it, I'm going to run this first and just we'll look at df1. So, and at the bottom, uh, you can see that Pandas tells us this data frame has 142 rows and 37 columns. And when the Pandas data frame is large and you ask uh, to print it out, you'll see that you get the first five rows, dot, 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 and then the last five rows. And similarly, if there's lots of columns, you might get the same thing for the columns, that it goes up to some number of columns, dot, 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 and then the rest of the columns. So we can't actually see all of the rows and columns when we're looking at this. There's ways to get around this. I'm not going to worry about that right now. The important thing is just to sort of understand the structure of the data, which is, again, like our previous Gapminder data set, we have a column called country that we've made into our indexes. That's why they're bold uh, in this first column here, because that's the index labels. And then we also have a column called continent, and that tells us if the country is in Africa or Europe or Oceania or America or, or whatever. And then all the other columns are GDP per capita. Okay, so hopefully that first line you could figure out based on the lesson up till now. But the next line is some new stuff. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's see, let me just run that command again without asking for the data frame. And now I'm going to add another cell, a code cell. Um, because I don't necessarily need to rerun that read CSV command every time. 
And I'm going to walk you through the next line of code without assigning it to df2 because I want to show you what the output is on the screen. So df1 square bracket, df1 square bracket, continent. Okay, so what this is doing is it's saying, okay, look in df1 and df1 where df1 continent equals equals. And we talked about equals equals in a previous lesson. It's testing equivalence. So because in Python, a single equals symbol represents assignment, we can't use that to test if two things are equivalent. We need to use two equals signs together. So that's what that is, equals equals Americas. So this is basically saying, take DF1, our data frame, and select where DF1 column continent is equal to Americas. This is a different kind of selection syntax than we saw above. We're not using dot lock because if we use dot lock, it would want rows. And what we want to say is we're looking in this column continent and select all the values that are uh, Americas. Run that. And you can see that the output is now the, the data frame, but only the countries who are in the Americas continent. So it's another way of subselecting the data. Um, that can be really important. It's a nice complement uh, to dot lock because dot lock um, wouldn't allow you to just select things based on this other column. Dot lock is based on what you've defined as the index column. So if, if you want to select based on a column that isn't an index, you can use this kinds of uh, kind of syntax. Okay, now I'm going to assign that to df2, and then the next line is df3 equals df2.drop Puerto Rico. And again, we didn't talk about dot drop, but you could probably diagnose it's a method because we're giving it a data frame, dot, and then some command name. And you know, fairly intuitively, dot drop drops particular data from a data frame. So if we say df3 equals df2.drop Puerto Rico, and then I ask for df3. So again, I'm sort of stepping through and looking at the output each time. Now, Puerto Rico is not in my output. So it's dropped that from the data frame and stored that in a new one. Uh, continuing on, df4 equals df3.drop continent axis equals one. All right, so again, we're, we're throwing in some new stuff that you haven't seen before, but again, dot drop, we're gonna drop something. In this case, what we're dropping is continent. Continent's actually a column name, not a row name. And that's why we have to include this additional argument, axis equals one. So let me show you what happens if I run it without axis equals one. I get an error, continent not found in axis. The reason for that is that if I say dot drop, pandas by default assumes that I'm talking about row labels. And so it's going to look for a row called continent, but continent's a column. And so in order to override that default behavior of dot drop, I need to say axis equals one. So in pandas, axis zero is the rows and axis one is the columns. And this applies across uh, a lot of different pandas methods and, and functions. So when I run that, I don't get an error. Now, how would you ever know that? Well, that's you would have to go to the pandas documentation, the pandas API, and look up the dot drop method, and then read that and see that by default it operates on rows. If you want to drop a column, you need to include axis equals one. And then finally, the last command is df. 4.2 underscore CSV result dot CSV. And what that does, dot two CSV is a method that will save whatever data frame you apply it to, to a file, and the file will be saved with whatever name you give it as the argument. So now if I go to my files tab, you can see that in the folder where this pandas data frames lesson is, I now also have a result.csv file. If I were to click on that and open it up, there's my CSV file. It looks kind of messy, but look the first row here, row one, the first column is country, comma, next column is GDP per cap, 1952, et cetera, et cetera. 
So we have country, we don't have the continent column because we dot dropped that. Um, and then you can see all the other rows there. All right. Next exercise is selecting indices. So explain in simple terms what IDX min and IDX max do and when you would use these methods. Um, so of course, you don't know because we didn't teach you that. But again, this is meant to be an inferential learning exercise where you figure it out. And this is really starting to push you in the direction of the mindset that you need to be in when you're coding and doing data science, which is that you're not always going to know everything. You're not going to know how to do everything. If you're looking at other people's code, inevitably, you're likely to see things that you've never seen before. So how do you sort of diagnose and unpack and start to understand what they do? So I'm going to say data equals pd.read underscore CSV data slash gap minder underscore GDP underscore Europe dot CSV comma index call equals country. Okay. And then data dot IDX min empty parentheses. What do we get out? We get a pandas series, so it's not nicely formatted as a table, it's a series. And the labels for the output are what we see on the left. So the labels correspond to what we know are column names in these GDP uh, CSV files. And then the values associated with those labels are countries. So IDX min seems to be pulling out a particular row label or index. Remember the the rows or labels are the indexes. So it's pulling out the indexes, uh, one index for each column. And you may know if you know much about sort of European history, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Albania were not wealthy countries, um, especially historically. And so it seems like what it's doing is probably pulling out the index corresponding to the value in each column that has the minimum value. Um, so this sort of answers a question that I left dangling up above, which is if I say, what if I say data.min, run that, my output is numerical. So it's, it's actually telling me the minimum numerical value in each column, so the, for each year. If I say IDX min, instead of giving me the value, it gives me the label, the index associated with each of those values. So now I, I, I know which country basically had the minimum value rather than seeing the, the minimum value itself. Similarly, data.idx max will show me the index of the country name in this case corresponding to the maximum value in each column. All right, now we get to practice with selection. So from the previous exercise, the Gapminder GDP data for Europe should be loaded in a data frame or a variable called data. Using this data frame, write an expression to select each of the following. So first one is GDP capita per capita for all countries in 1982. So we want to say data, name of our data frame, and then we're going to use a method. And we want all countries in 1982. So we know that um, to get 1982, we want to use label-based indexing, right? So we want to say dot lock, square bracket. Now, countries are rows, and we want all countries, so we want all rows. To get that, we use a colon, comma, and then columns. We want 1982. We know that all of our column labels start with GDP, capital P for per cap, underscore, and then the year, in this case, 1982. Run that. So now I get all countries in 1982. Next one is GDP per capita for Denmark in all years. So now we want a single row for a single country, but all the years. But again, because it's Denmark, it's a label, we want to use df.lock and then Denmark. And we could say comma colon, run that. But again, if we don't give it a second argument, we don't specify the columns, it assumes we want all the columns. So we get that. We see that our output here includes the GDP per capita for all years, but it also includes that last column region, 
which we created when we were doing the split apply combine exercise. So if we really wanted to do all years but not that extra column because we just wanted numerical values, we could use colon and then tell it the last column label that we want. So remember, if you don't put anything before the colon, it assumes you want to start at the beginning, in this case, the first column, and go up to and including the last column. So up to and including because we're using label-based indexing with dot lock. So if I say GDP per cap underscore and just look, my last column of numbers is 2007. Run that. There I go. I get all of the years, but not the region. Uh, so in the same vein, if I want GDP per capita for all countries for years after 1985, I could try this. Um, so df.lock. So I want all countries. So a colon in the, the rows position. And then I want from GDP per cap 19, whoops, underscore. 1985, colon. So that'll go from 1985 to the end. All right. An interesting thing about this is there's actually no column in the data frame uh, called 1985. But Pandas is smart enough to recognize that there's numbers at the ends of all of these column names and just take the ones that are greater than 1985, in other words. So it sort of looks and sees that there's a, an order to those column labels and it applies it appropriately, which is kind of cool. Pandas is quite smart in quite a lot of ways. And then finally in this section, GDP per capita for each country in 2007 as a multiple of GDP per capita for that country in 1952. If you didn't get that one, that's okay. It's a little tricky, but we want df.lock square bracket colon because we want each country comma, and then GDP per cap underscore 2007. So I'm going to, again, you know, this is a good approach is to break this problem down. So we can get those as a multiple of GDP per capita for that country. So in other words, kind of as a percentage or a fraction of. So what is it in 2007 relative to what it was in 1952? So the way we do that is we get that, and then we do a divide by, so a slash, and then df.lock, square bracket, colon, comma, GDP per cap, underscore, 1952. So in this case, what we're showing you is that if you do this df.lock to select a particular column, you can actually use that as the input to a math equation. So in this case, we're dividing one value, the values in one column by the values in another, another column. And we get the output here. We could even then assign that output back to a new column. So I could say um, df square bracket, um, and I don't know what uh, short form is, 2007 rel 2, 19, 52 equals, right? So again, if I assign something to a column label in DF that doesn't already exist, pandas will make that column. And then I will ask for DF. So it runs without errors. We get the whole table. And now you can see I've got this column at the end that I just created 2007 rel to 1952 and the values are in there. All right, so that brings us to the end of our lesson. Just to summarize, Pandas data frames are a powerful way of storing and working with tabular data, so data that's organized in rows and columns, like a spreadsheet. Pandas columns and rows can have names. Pandas row names are called indexes. By default, these are numeric, but we can give them other labels, for example, by defining an index column. We use the .ilock method with the data frame to select values by integer location using the row column format. So rows first, column second. We can also use the .lock method with the data frame to select rows and columns based on their names. So the labels that we store as indexes and the column names. We can use a colon in .ilock or .lock for the rows and or columns 
If we use the colon on its own, we mean all rows or all columns, but we can also apply slicing if we put values before and or after the colon uh, to select particular ranges uh, of rows and or columns. We can use comparisons to select data based on value, and we can select values or NAN using a Boolean mask so we can mask out data based on those selectors. And then finally, we can use split apply combine to derive analytics from groupings within a data frame. So this can be a very powerful way to group data. For example, the way we did it was by region in Europe, and then obtain summary statistics or plots or do other things uh, to the data based on those groupings. So that's the end of our lesson. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.